All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Podcast 47. We're so glad to have you with us again tonight. Once again, as always, I'm joined by my right-hand man, Anthony Pierleone, our video guru, Kevin Minto, who will be manning the hangout. And our very special guest tonight is high school freshman, Michael Skidstead. Um, Michael is really into conservation for a ninth grader. He's been to TSA conferences. In fact, he even got to go to Madagascar um, late last spring and assist on the ground as the TSA and other organizations cared for all of those um, confiscated radiated tortoises, 10 grand of them. Um, so tonight we're going to talk to Michael about some of his experiences while he was there, as well as uh, several other topics. Um, feel free to chime in with questions on the chat and Kevin uh, will get those to us. So thanks for joining us, Michael. Glad to have you. I'm um, glad to be on. It's uh, a really really on the podcast um, past. Really, when I first listened to it, uh, I was like, that'd be so cool to be on the show. And here I am. Uh, and super excited. It's just, it's really an honor and uh, a great pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're super excited. Just for anyone out there, any any early naysayers, like you guys have a, uh, a high school freshman on the show. What the heck is wrong with you guys? You're running out of guys for guests. Let me tell you something. Michael is the best, first of all. And we all can learn a lot from him. Um, and I hope that by the end of this talk, we all can learn a lot about this process, um, kind of what we're going to go through tonight. Um, <clears throat> the, the wonderful conversation, because I know we're going to have a wonderful conversation. And just kind of learning what we all could do a little bit better. I think one thing in the turtle world is, um, and, and I think just like uh, her pediculture in general and um, uh, her pathology in general is, you know, handing down what you know to, and especially her pediculture a lot more than, than um, uh, her pathology, but handing down what you know to the younger generation, being willing to share, take someone under your wing and, and help them kind of get the tools um, to kind of carry on all the work that we've been doing for years and to do it the right way and to bring their new passion, energy, and knowledge to, um, to what, you know, we do. So we're super excited to have Michael here tonight. And um, just in talking to him briefly and reading some of your writing, you don't even know that yet, Michael. I'm going to tell you, I've been reading some of your writing lately. Um, I'm not a creep, I'm not stalking you or anything like that, but we'll talk about that after. But I'm just super excited to have you here. And super grateful that you are in this kind of world that we live in, um, that you're here and, and you know, helping out with, uh, fight the good fight, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Turtle, turtles, turtle people are definitely the cruelest. I've done, I've done some, I guess, lizard research and other reptiles, but nothing, nothing beats the turtle people. Just definitely the cruelest group out there. Uh, and not to put any other reptile research down, it's all really cool, but just the, the group and the tight, the tightness and the close, uh, uh, just the, the tight knit group of uh, turtle experts and herpetologists within the turtle uh, world. It's just, it's really not like the other groups that I've been in. So that's, I guess, really just what's so cool about it. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a great group to be in and to be involved with. It's awesome. So how, how does, I mean, Steve spoke about how you've been to TSA conferences and you talk about different groups that you've kind of been involved in, not just turtle stuff, but other reptiles, other animals and stuff like that. I mean, how does, uh, how does a 14 year old find that stuff? When, when did you start finding things? When did you realize that you may be more interested in, in, you know, research as opposed to just going to a reptile show and buying a pet animal? That's actually a great question. Uh, it kind of started out Actually, I'll just get into, I guess, the story about how I got so into uh, just turtles and reptiles in general. And for a lot of people, uh, so I live in California, and out here where I live, um, uh, there's not too many turtles or really reptiles in general in the area I am. It's really urbanized. Um, and for a lot of people, I know the experience is uh, they go out in their backyard, and they're catching snakes and these turtles, and uh, they kind of grow up uh, around people who... I uh, know this stuff and uh, they're just from the animal experiences. For me, it was a little bit different. Um, I sort of fell into uh, the turtle world maybe nine years ago, uh, first grade. Uh, I picked up a little book. Um, it was just a little book 
super simple on just turtles, maybe a five minute read. And I just read that book for two hours. And as a first grader, two hours of reading is uh, a lot. And I was just going through the same information. I was just fascinated by it. Um, and I think a lot of people also have the experience just going in their backyard, but they're also the people that sort of go to these reptile shows. Uh, and that's just a different kind of uh, herpetic culture as opposed to just being uh, an active researcher. And there's two different kind of sides to that. And I sort of fell into the research side, I think, because I was really fascinated just with the animal biology uh, and how it was made. Uh, and I sort of learned about keeping the animals and breeding them and caring for them later on uh, as I kind of looked into it. But by then, I was already sort of into the biological aspect uh, and the research aspect and had already really found like uh, research gate and research uh, papers and then sort of learned about what's going on with uh, captive breeding and, and just captive care. And I will, I will say that the turtle room is actually probably the first source that I, I sort of learned about what was going on in captivity uh, as opposed to in the field. Uh, and then sort of as I delved more into the Turtle Room stuff, I learned about more of these projects uh, and I got, it's social media actually too. So uh, I think the, the real thing for me was I didn't, I didn't grow up as much going to uh, uh, maybe the uh, reptile shows. And now I do definitely. Uh, it's really fun. Uh, but I sort of grew up uh, learning about the biology of the animal and sort of molded into sort of every aspect, uh, captive care. Now I have 10 different species, uh, 10 different species of turtles here, uh, my house, and uh, I go to the shows. So I sort of evolved into that, I think, and uh, more from the biological aspect. So I guess that's kind of how it happened. And uh, that's my story, pretty much how I got into it. Nice. It sounds like a great story. It's it's kind of cool to see uh, a student get interested in reading the research side before the captivity side. I think it like often works the way the other way around. You end up finding some animal, caring for it a bit, and then all of a sudden you get hooked, and then you're one of those people who can't stop buying reptiles. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Honestly, wanting to read like the scholarly articles and journals and things like that that like read like stereo instructions as opposed to reading the fun stuff on the captive bread side <laughs> and the captive breeding side. Like that's, that's amazing. That's impressive. You're a prodigy. You're like the LeBron James of, of, of turtle guys. Seriously. <laughs> that's a great analogy. That should be the cover of the Batiger this year. Should just be your picture. Like, like when LeBron was in high school. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not as tall, but yeah. That's all right. You don't need to be tall on this. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about perspective. Let me tell you, I'm as tall as LeBron and I can tell you, you do not need to be tall in the turtle world. Aren't you actually a little taller than LeBron Anthony? No, I don't, I don't think. Well, it depends what you're listed as. Like, we're I think we're like this. Well, we used to be the same size when I was a basketball player, but now I'm, you know, Gra gravity. Yeah, I'm not, maybe. I didn't think I'm LeBron was six either. nine, but yeah, LeBron's six nine. Oh, is he? I thought he was like seven, six seven. No, he's uh, Kobe was six seven. LeBron, LeBron oh. six, nine. but he's. Yeah, he's he's not he's not three forty five. Let's just put it that way. Not <laughs> what I know is. I'm just asking for a friend. I'm asking for a friend. Let me ask. Anthony carries a little baby weight. A little bit. A little bit. No one ever tells you that that when you have when you have kids and your wife wants to try a whole bunch of different food and then she gets nauseous and doesn't want to eat it that you have to eat it. You know what I'm talking about, Kev? Golden Corral, baby. Kev, everyone, congratulations. Kevin Kevin had a baby, not physically, but his wife had a baby. A week ago today? Two weeks ago today. Two weeks ago today. Time flies uh, when it's your kid. Yeah. Yeah. That's baby number two. Michael, um, don't get so, any ideas now. Don't get any ideas, Michael. We don't want you having any kids. <laughs> yeah. Michael, way too early. He's a, he's a celebrity. He's on the podcast. He, we just called him a prodigy. There's going to be all sorts of ladies all over him. Michael, I'm 36, and I think I'm too young for kids, so way too That's young. True. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> I'm bald with a gray beard, and I am too young for kids too. I agree. Oh. Just, just saying. Sorry, did I take it? I took it down that road. I apologize, guys. I really do. We were having a fun. Okay. We were. We we always go on at least one. I think basketball related tangent. So we got it out of the way. Just you know, ten minutes in or so. So there's our basketball related tangent for the night. I. Um, <laughs> I, I saw I remember maybe what a years back on the channel the the new species the the video yeah. had me for like thirty seconds I before I was like oh wow and then that was, Duncan Billis yeah oh yeah that's, Duncan yeah. Billis I was, I, was not, Billis, yeah. I was not excited I, I I gave Kevin Kevin did it as a joke and 
we said we said okay, but I, I normally don't love clickbait that much. <laughs> no, it was, it, was, it was pretty good. Leone yeah, Dunkabalis. People were excited about uh, the new species that was discovered. Uh, just in case anyone is watching and doesn't know what we're talking about, Kevin made a, a YouTube video of me dunking a basketball. It's not pretty, but uh, he named the the, the uh, video new species. What was it, like Pierleonis Dunkabalis? Yeah, Pierleonis Dunkabalis, yeah. yeah. Pierleone being my last name, turning it to Pierleonis, trying to make it sound Latin. Very silly, very silly. Uh, topical humor, but uh, a lot a of people... Of it, you know? and, and I understand that. I understand that. But, you know, we're all guilty of it on some level, and at least ours was, like, topical and, and small and probably had, like, 200 views, so yeah, not that... Sure. Yeah. It's not like we got, like, you know, 2 million views. Let's take a look. Across the uh, reptile community. It was, it was pretty small. Kevin does a good job, though. Perhaps. So, um... Let's go turn the page to Madagascar, Michael. Okay. So, go back to your – you were there for how long? I was Two there weeks? for eight days. Eight, eight days. days. Okay. So um, talk about uh, – start from, you know, when you, when you finally got uh, to, the, to the site because that was a lot of travel. So then you finally had to well, – you, know, you flew a couple big planes. Then you probably flew a little plane, and then you probably drove for a bit. Oh, so yeah. when you finally got there, what was the first thing that was running through your head? Well, when I finally got there, um, there there wasn't much going through my head. I kind of just hit the hit the hay and was pr pretty much out for the night. I, it was um, the travel there uh, was unbelievable. Um, I would say we ran into all sorts of bad luck. Um, we we left from LAX and flew into what well, we were planning to fly into uh, Chicago. But there was a storm. And so, uh, get this, we ended up going up into the air and circling above Chicago uh, for three hours. And then we touched down in Minnesota, in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and then we took off about an hour later and we circled for another three hours over Chicago. Uh, and then we landed again at Minneapolis in uh, Minnesota. And it was about two in the morning by then. Uh, and we, there were no hotels left. And so we ended up staying in the Minneapolis airport overnight uh, for four hours of sleep uh, and then left to Miami, uh, from Miami to London, uh, and then a nice layover in London for 10 hours. So we just slept from pretty much that whole time and then headed to South Africa and then like four planes in Madagascar. Uh, and the planes in Madagascar are kind of like taxis. So they kind of take you from one place to the next. And it's like you make stops. Um, I guess like a bus, right? You make a stop before your actual destination. That's how the planes are there. Uh, and so we finally, I think the trip there was nearing 80 hours. So uh, a few days worth of flying. Um, so, but once Exhausting. Get, oh, yeah. Uh, we, we headed in, uh, when we got to the, the Malagasy Airport, um, in Antenna Narivo, there were three other people that were actually going out on the plane with us. And I think we just kind of, when we got to the actual site at Ifadi, uh, we just kind of separated and within an hour, we're pretty much out. And then the next day, that's when everything kind of kicked in and how okay. cool it was. Um, and just the place is so different. Uh, and really one of the things that got me was thinking that it's daytime here and back home, um, it's, it's not reversed pretty much 10 hour difference um and then another thing that was pretty cool uh was just the orientation too i mean that's the i think second farthest point from california uh and from where i am it was oh, about yeah. a thousand miles so just thinking about that and just before going to the actual sanctuary uh in ifadi uh, and helping the animals there uh i just uh, how beautiful the place was uh, and just the biodiversity. Within an hour, I caught a snake. Uh, we found some little uh, legless uh, lizards and some more uh, uh, some lizards and stuff. And then we got to the tortoises, and there were so many cool things. But that's just the main things that just go through your head. And uh, in on the the the, uh, the shuttle ride back, uh, well, actually from the airport in uh, Tulier uh, to Ifadi. Um, it was about an hour, and I stayed awake for about 30 minutes, which is just saying something for uh, how cool it was. Um, but it was definitely an awesome experience. Just And just that, the first part, just soaking all of it in, 
and how different it is <clears throat> just every other place. So I have a kind of not a follow-up question, a preamble question. Definitely. When I was 14 in skateboarding, I could barely get my parents to let me go to three towns over. How do you convince your parents to let you go halfway across the world? <laughs> um, so, first of all, my parents are awesome. Uh, they're super supportive. Um, they're, they just support everything that I do with the turtles and tortoises, and I, they're definitely really into it. And I know, I, I guess there's a lot of people maybe could be restricted by parents. That's definitely not my case. I mean, I get to do all this awesome stuff. Uh, and it's just through them and it's they they make those decisions and they let me do this and just follow my dreams. Um, nice. But uh, it, it, this was actually pretty interesting. I, um, I pretty much emailed Jordan Gray. Uh, I said that I could do anything to help. Uh, San Diego Zoo isn't far from where I am. Uh, I could get some supplies there and ship them off to Madagascar for whatever they needed because uh, one of the big coordinators was at San Diego. Um, and sort of, I was at, I was at lunch actually. Um, and I was in the car and he, uh, I think I'm forget how it evolved, but I ended up calling him and I said, uh, you know, I'm graduating eighth grade. We're doing nothing in school pretty much. Uh, at this point, uh, we stopped doing any academic learning and, uh, we have like two weeks of school. Left. Um, and I said, I could come, uh, and see, see how that would work. And I kind of just pitched the idea. Uh, and it took a little convincing uh, to do, but within, I think, maybe two weeks, uh, we were on a plane out. Um, and that's just a, kind of a testimony to how cool just my parents really are in supporting it. Um, Seriously, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. But uh, it, was, it was, I think everything just kind of fell at the right time. Um, uh, not for the tortoises, but for my sake, I guess, to get out there. Uh, school is over in two weeks. Uh, it was end of May. So it was just perfect timing, I guess. And everything just fell into the right place. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, while you were in Madagascar, what kind of, um, what kind of details or activities did they have you help with the most? Uh, did you get to try out a lot of different uh, things that needed done or did you kind of focus in on one thing that you, that you could do really well for the, for the chunk of time? Definitely. Um, so while I was there, most of the time I was doing uh, work with the actual animals, uh, a lot of hands-on stuff. So whether that be a cleaning out uh, the, the pens, uh, I was in charge of water, a lot of stuff. Uh, one of the pens, we had a lot more water dishes than in some of the other ones. And by the end of the week, we had that pretty much sorted out. Um, and a little bit of helping with some of the actual tortoises. Some of them were in pretty bad shape in quarantine. Uh, and so doing, dealing with some of the, the stuff we were dealing with there um, and just helping some of them, uh, like the, we had to do a lot of feeding. Uh, so just pretty much everything. And that's kind of the case with everyone. Everyone was kind of pitched in with everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because we were, I mean, for 10,000, 9,000 animals while I was there, I mean, we had maybe wow. Uh, that's a lot of animals to deal with. So we just, it was kind of just like, we need this done. Uh, who, who's going to do it and who's going to do this and this. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of stuff. Um, we arrived at the facility uh, every morning at, I believe around 8.30 and we were gone by 5.30 or 6. So we were there for a good, good chunk of the day. Um, and by the end of the day, pretty much we're asleep by eight that night. So, uh, and it was just constant work. Um, a lot of the time it was pretty, it was pretty uh, exhausting, uh, as you can, as uh, most people can imagine. And, um, I like to say just football and exercise really come in handy with that kind of stuff, uh, especially just with, with constantly being under pressure, carrying, uh, 70 pounds of tortoises, uh, in 90 degree heat and just doing it for a long time. It's, it, but, but it's 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 almost fun too because it is really fun just helping the animals knowing that you're av you're making a difference for this the future of these animals uh, in the wild for an animal that is not yet <laughs> I guess well in its situation we can consider it endangered the numbers are still yeah. relatively high but uh, its situation is just really bad and so knowing that I had an impact is just really an amazing thing. All right, so you mentioned football again there. So I'm going to ask, which is a harder day's work, two-a-days or the work you were putting in for those, uh, you know, like 10 to 12-hour days there out in Malagasy? Well, actually, uh, <laughs> so for, for our conditioning week, I guess our, our summer practice, we started in June. 
so we've been going we've been going and we do we didn't do two a days but we do uh four hour practices uh and we were doing that in the summer uh five days a week and so now now we do it six days a week and that's pretty much three hours six days a week practices um and so i i'd say the hardest conditioning work that we've done a madagascar is probably equal i i'd okay. say that and it just kind of hits that point where it's like even i mean it's yeah. just <laughs> but yeah yeah wow I, if if i can just say if i can just give two um make, make two comments not necessarily questions but uh, number one, I agree. Your parents are amazing. Um, I love my parents, but I wish I had your parents. And um, I also think you're amazing. I mean, for you to have the foresight to say, you know what? I bet this could fly. Um, that's that's pretty awesome too. And and then also shout out to our friend Jordan Gray because that's really cool um, that he was able to say, you know what? I think this could work. You know, um, that's a long time away, and and it's pretty awesome that he was able to to. It's just on his end too. I think that's awesome because it, it makes it a whole different uh, type of project. You know, you have to have somebody who is um, pretty on top of their game to be able to make that fly. Like with a bigger organization, say, hey, I want to bring this kid along who I don't necessarily know that well, right? Like Jordan's not like your uncle, right? I I've been Jordan for a while. We we would do the uh, the North American Freshwater Turtle Research. Stuff. Okay, so you guys know each other in person. Yeah, yeah I cool. yeah. Awesome. And you, so then you've already traveled then because you're from California Definitely. and the project yeah. in California. So you've already traveled to go and tur do turtle work and you already knew Jordan in person. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. He's where, in, right? where in California are you? Uh, I'm in Orange County. So yeah. Yep. Just outside LA basically, yeah, right? Just outside yeah. LA. yeah. I used to have to go there for work. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a pretty urbanized place. Uh, mm -hmm hard to get turtle work done here but it's yeah no it's there's a there's a lot of uh businesses oh yeah lots of yeah. stuff here um, my other information my, my comment that i want to make for you was just to say like that was the worst travel story i've heard in my entire life as like <laughs> beside maybe like moses <laughs> that was, that, that's really bad. That's really bad. Like, I've never heard that. When you kept talking about Minnesota or, or Minneapolis, I'm like, what? Are we kidding? Is he still there? Wow. The, the really bad part well, of the trip to be. He landed at two different airports in Minnesota. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's atrocious. I never want to complain about travel again, and I never want to hear anyone complain about travel again. <laughs> I, just want to I, was, I was waiting for you to say some lightning came and like struck something and parted the clouds so you could finally land or I, I don't know. I was looking for a miracle. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No. Yeah. And if that, the travel story there was pretty bad. Uh, but on the way back, um, I ended up getting, or once we, once we flew out, I ended up, uh, so I went the whole week without getting sick. Uh, maybe everyone in the group suffered about a night of just, painful illness uh and i thought i was gonna make it through i thought it was uh, pretty cool for not <laughs> not not getting sick and so the day we were leaving well actually we we went to anten and Arivo by plane and the night we were about to leave i was getting a little bit of a stomach cake i was like all right maybe i ate something it's not gonna be that bad i wake up in the morning and i can barely move uh i'm completely uh just stiff in bed um, and I had to, we, we had to go, uh, I wasn't going to stay another day. There are no hospitals really there. Um, and so we ended up flying on a plane out and the whole time I was having pretty much convulsions. Um, I was shaking. Um, my fever was 105, I think at the highest. Uh, and so we were on a plane out and it was a three hour plane. Uh, and so we landed and I actually ended up getting a little bit better. It was, it was the weirdest illness I've ever had. Um, it was really, really bad for two to two and a half hours. And then it would just calm down for four hours and then it would start up again. And I would just be really in bad shape. Um, and so we were planning going on a safari actually, cause we were in South Africa, uh, once we landed down, once we touched down there. Uh, and so I got, we went to the hospital at 12 o'clock at night, uh, in South Africa and left at like six in the morning and they did a bunch of fluid stuff and I felt normal. I felt fine again. Um, and so we ended up going on the safari, uh, and that was probably the biggest mistake. 
of the trip and I ended up doing the whole thing again and we ended up staying in hospital in South Africa for an extra four days uh, and then left four days later and the, that's when they learned the fever was almost to the point where they needed to put me in an ice bath uh, to cool it down. So How it, high that, was it? What? How high was it? Do you remember? Uh, 105, I think. It's oh, wow. High. I once I once marched a parade while I was in high school with a 104. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, I mean. Just couldn't miss the parade, huh? <laughs> I, I was I was tough, and I was just like, I never missed anything, so I was like, I'm not going to miss something for this, so. <laughs> Did you know you can fast forward and put a parade in slow motion? Were you twirling a baton? Baton? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Although I was known to throw my saxophone during our uh, show in college. Oh, you're like Lisa Simpson. Cool. <laughs> oh, that's right. She played saxophone. Yeah. So, I, oh my gosh. I could talk to you, honestly, for like a trip to Madagascar uh, worth of time. Like we could, this could be in 80, words, 80 hours. <laughs> like, I don't even know which way to go with questions. Um, so you've had the opportunity then to work with tons of species with the, with, with NAFTA. Uh, yeah. You've been in Madagascar. What, like, like what, what species are like really uh, have you excited at this point in your life? Um, there's kind of two sides, I guess, to that. So, I've um, like in the research field, um, pretty much most things, um, some of the main ones now, I guess, are some like terrapins. I love diamondback terrapins. I haven't actually been uh, able to really get out and do that. Uh, we were uh, a year ago in North Carolina. I did some work with the sea turtle center, the Karen Beasley sea turtle center. Uh, and we went in the salt marsh about every day. We couldn't find any. Uh, and so we were we were in the salt marsh for a good four hours most days trying to find it, but we couldn't um, for whatever reason. They're just too hard to find. And um, but that was about a year ago, and just that's one of the ones I'm really hoping to get out and just do some stuff with and um, stuff across the world too. Um, I mean, just the raffetis. I mean, I can't really work with those, but just knowing the updates and what's going on with that species, uh, and that's just really gotten me excited to hear that just back. I mean, a day before the irradiated tortoise confiscation, they did some eDNA work. Yeah. Uh, confirmed it in, um, I forget the name of the lake. Uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the lakes near Don Mo, where the other one supposedly is. So uh, that was just, that was really cool. And um, I just a lot of stuff. So some of the work with uh, alligator snapping turtles, I love them. Uh, just any calidrid. Um, I did a few presentations this summer on those. IHS was one, uh, and that was one of the competitions this year. And I presented about common snappers uh, and alligator snappers and sort of conservation with those. So those are the ones that are getting me excited in the research research world. Um, and in captivity, that's kind of a different story. Uh, I'm really into the testudo, uh, anything testudo related. And I was planning on getting some golden Greeks, trying to get some uh, to breed. Um, but I ended up getting some, uh, ornate box turtles just cause there was more, uh, and I want to just do some, uh, some of the more native species to where I am. Uh, and the golden Greeks actually do pretty well in here cause it's sort of near the sort of natural climate. Uh, and I was planning on doing those, but the ornate's kind of the same deal and they're closer to home. Uh, so I thought I could give them probably a little bit of a better home here. Uh, so I plan on breeding those soon next season. Uh, and just, I guess, uh, there's been a few more things. Um, they did recently do the genome sequence of the painted turtle, like the full genome, and that's got me really. That's really an exciting one. Uh, just that they're learning a lot of stuff from that. They've done some of the anti-aging things with the turtles from that. Uh, some of the stuff they did in the ES George Reserve too. They've been looking at that kind of stuff um, with some of the older specimens that were marked. 50 plus years ago there and um, with the genome they're finding some specific things uh, i forget the details but I, th I believe that there's some specific genes that are in these turtles that humans and other creatures have uh but the turtles don't seem to have so they're trying to link what what's causing uh why are these genes absent in the turtles and then one of the things that they were learning was that the, the uh, there was something to do i forget the, the specifics of it but with diabetes too uh the turtles have a specific gene um that has 
potentially some control for diabetes. So I believe they were doing that with Heloderma too, where they are, is that something else? But I think it's diabetes too. They, they're using the Heloderma. Uh, and so if they could use panty turtle genes to somehow cure some diseases in humans, um, that would just be another practical application. And I find a lot of times when I'm talking to people about um, why we should conserve turtles besides the fact that they're just awesome, they're turtles. Uh, and there's so many things like, that they do. I mean, they're seed dispersers. They're dispersed. That some of the seeds need to germinate within the turtle gut to actually uh, to grow. Um, they, in some areas, I think uh, a lot of people can debate. It's a highly debated subject, but a lot of times turtles are uh, meat and food for people in some of these rural areas where they don't have access to as much. Uh, and I think in a controlled environment. Um, and at this present state, it definitely isn't in a lot of places, and we need to help fix that. But I think in a controlled environment, uh, it's just part of someone's lifestyle, I guess. And that's something that, well, if we work to conserve them, then everyone can get what they need out of them. Uh, and so we can uh, just have them just living beside us, and the people that depend on them can be depending on them. Um, but I think that just the, the whole new work that they're doing with the painted turtle, the anti-aging, uh, and even the diabetes-related uh, genes in the turtles that's just something that is another human related application and when you're talking to humans about why we can should conserve another animal a lot of times with humans that aren't maybe into the turtle conservation as much when you give them an application that has to do directly with them or someone that's around them uh, it's a lot easier for them to uh, accept or endorse it so um, that's that's just uh, a little bit of a tangent just on what's I'm really interested in now I love it. Now, yeah. Let me ask you a question. You said that you're going to the TTP conference in Arizona in November. Definitely. Yeah. So are you going to be speaking there? Yeah. So I, we are still figuring out the specifics. I'm talking with um, the moderator for that conference. Um, the, the, the one who sort of uh, the, the people who kind of run that and we're going, we're planning on speaking about, uh, sort of the Madagascar trip, and I might do sort of a combo talk with somebody else um, at that, and just, I, I guess uh, that one's upcoming, but just as a little uh, hint for everyone that's going to be attending TPP, TTPG, uh, it'll be something on Madagascar. Was was Jordan yeah. talking about heading out there to do the TTPG talk, or not, not the, the Madagascar one? I'm with, not sure. Who was that? So, I think originally he planned on doing it, but he might end up doing a different talk. He might talk about Madagascar as well, um, or I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the specifics are, uh, but he did tell me that he planned on doing it, but that I might just do it and that he might do something else related uh, to the. To okay, the, but it was Jordan, right? Yeah, yeah, it was that. Yeah, I, th I thought I remember jo talking to Jordan about him going out to that one this year, so. Yeah. Why didn't you tell me? What was that? Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know Jordan was going. I'm getting really excited because I'm going as well. Right. Jordan knows you're going. So there is that. I did say to Jordan that Anthony's going. <laughs> He's obviously excited. So, yeah, Jordan, Jordan, will, be, Jordan will be good out there. Um, I think he's excited to get out there too. So This is terrific. I'm it's one it. I wish I could get out to. It's just it, it literally is the worst time of year for me to go attend a conference. Like if I could pick the worst week out of the entire calendar year for me to try to attend a turtle conference, that would be the one I'd pick. Well, that's how I feel about TSA. I totally understand. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, because your wife always schedules your family vacation for the hottest week of the year for whatever oh, reason. It's my daughter's birthday. Oh, well, it's your birthday, too. Yeah, I know. And that was that was why I knew I was going to get to TSA eventually. Every single year it comes up, and I'm like, ah, I, you know, I'm going to try. Um, but but once we had my daughter, who's now four, and that's, you know, right around her birthday, like, I have no chance anymore. I can't say, but it's my birthday because it's also her birthday. So just, you know, first world, first world problems, whatever. I mean. I'll keep trying. That's all I could do, right? That's all we could do. Is yeah. just, but that's awesome. I can't help but, you know, Michael, as you're speaking, I can't help but 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 sit here and, and kind of get into it and think, wow, this is a this is a 14 year old. You know, what is this kid going to sound like when he's in college? What is he going to sound like when he's, you know, professional? It's it's really exciting. Like, where do you see yourself going with this in the future? Do you want to be Jordan Gray? Do you want to be way better and cooler than Jordan Gray? Because that's OK, too. Uh, I, I think, um, I 
sort of my plan and it could definitely change, uh, but I kind of know um, there's just sort of a, um, a, I guess a connection. So I know that in the future, this is what I want to do. Uh, it's just the passion that I have. And I just kind of found it early. And a lot of people ask like, uh, that maybe they're, they ask like, do you think that this is going to change? Do you think um, that the passion is, um, what do you think about it? And I, I think, it's different for a lot of different people. When a passion isn't necessarily something that is, I think people try to, a lot of times kids are sort of testing out different things. What, what do they want to do? Um, and this is just for everyone, I guess. Uh, and a lot of times I disagree sort of in school, a lot of activities sometimes find your passion. And I think it's mistaken a lot of the time. And I think a passion isn't something that's necessarily found at a specific time. Um, this is just from my experience, uh, and I've met I've met a lot of other kids too, uh, especially from IHS, the one of the conferences I attended. That definitely I can tell share that passion. Uh, but I, I think a lot of times there's a stereotype that the passions are met sort of later on in life uh, when you have more experience. And I think um, just it's something that's found when it's found. And I think that I just found it kind of at an early age. Uh, and from that experience, uh, I mean, it could change in the future. I don't know, but. I just have a, this feeling that it won't uh, just in it's kind of my heart. So, uh, cause I feel like I'm not just doing it to do it. I'm doing it for really the animals. I just want, I want to see, I want to see in a hundred years, just a future that's different for these animals uh, uh, and just to help all of them. And so I think uh, that's just how, that's how I think the passion is and that's how I got into it. But I see in the future, I, I see myself, uh, I definitely want to go and get a degree, uh, maybe a master's um, in in some sort of area related to it, a biology master's, and then potentially go to vet school because uh, I'm really interested in the veterinary side of it, but not <laughs> not as much um, doing like going straight from vet school into doing an internship at a hospital and then starting a clinic. Uh, more along the sides of just having a vet degree, going out in the field. Uh, and doing field research for a long time, and then maybe later on in life, retiring sort of into a veterinary degree, uh, so I can uh, sort of, I can apply what I've learned from the animals to the actual practice. Uh, so that's kind of where I see what I want to do, and that's kind of my path. And, and taking 21st century stuff and making that kind of uh, a little bit about it. So like uh, Instagram and social media, I like doing videos too, and just taking a 21st century spin on it. And if I do that kind of research, just to do updates and uh, just to really showcase what the life is like. And just, well, and can't have a, we can't have enough vets with, with, uh, with knowledge of, of caring for turtles either. Um, I'm, I'm sure that was one thing you witnessed in Madagascar, just how like having a vet who can be on the ground to manage these things um, can be really a key part of a lot of this a oh, lot yeah. of research or saving. Um, and there, there are relatively few vets with that reptile experience. Oh, that, yeah. You know, TSA needs a vet at the TSC, you know, so they have, they have somebody that they have on, on retainer, essentially, you know, zoos need somebody who can do those kinds of things and other conservation organizations, you know, TSA has that as the vet you met out in Madagascar. Right. So, um, you know, just having those people around with the veterinary experience that are involved in the field work is is truly beneficial. So I was actually had a similar question. I was like, so you want to go into research, veterinary, like where are you headed? But Anthony got beat me to the question. <laughs> yeah. I think what's cool is is for, for a young dude, you've had a chance to to actually hang out like in the thick of it and actually see like like what type of what type of you know swag or or like gangster walk like a like a a vet is walking into the place with as opposed to like somebody else you know what i mean like what type of swagger yeah. yeah like that to me is like a really cool thing to see um early on i i work for a veterinary hospital but i didn't make that change until recently like until later in life when i already kind of am stuck in my ways i have my undergraduate degree but i'm not going back to school and getting more loans at this point if i could go back and do it all over again like i i would kill to be able to go back and do what you're doing right now, I think is the coolest thing ever. Um, so I look forward to it for years to come, like living vicariously through you and the cool stuff that you're going to be able to do. But um, I, I think it's a cool opportunity to see kind of what the future might look like because you're seeing this stuff early on. Um, is If this is something that you want to go into, I think that's really cool. Yeah. 
No, yeah, the the vets just in Madagascar, they were amazing. And I mean, the knowledge, just they know so much about the, t- uh, the subject. And I learned so much uh, just from and how things work, too. It's just a totally different aspect. I mean, there's the veterinary side and then there's the how are we going to get stuff done uh, veterinary side. So that's just a crucial thing that I uh, just have experience I really recognize now. So it's, it's pretty that was just an interesting thing. Uh, and I yeah, I totally agree. Just seeing how everything works. Uh, Right now, uh, it's just, it's really a cool thing to be able to do. I'm so excited to talk to you and, and to see where you go with this in the future. I really am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Same with, same with everyone and uh, yourself and all the Turtle Room. I, I always love looking at the updates and everything. It's just, it's really it's so cool. It means a lot. We, we, we try to make stuff, um, we try to make stuff accessible for people. And it's exciting to have a younger person say that they see um, what's out there and stuff like that. And you said that you watched the podcast before, which is really cool. Oh yeah. At the same time, I can't, I can't really get too excited about it because you're you're a prodigy, so you don't count. <laughs> I'm a, I'm I'm convinced myself that you're finding things that are out there that other people aren't. Like for instance, scholarly journals at age fourteen, <laughs> just reading the most boring. Uh, Macro Kelly's alligator snapping turtle um, articles that, that there are and loving every minute of it. It's terrific. It really is. Makes me want to cry. The, the, yeah, Macro Kelly stuff is, that's some crazy stuff. You know what I mean? Proud of you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, Michael, you had a, your, your talk was filmed, right? We're going to be airing that on our channel at some point. Soon. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm still in the process of, I actually have the card back here. Uh, people gave to me, but I, I have to contact the Georgia Reptile Society for that. Um, and I think that I ended I did send the email a while back and I never replied. So I just have to do it again. But the people that filmed it was the leader of that society. Um, and she did all the work with that. And so she has both a film and there were no heloderma talks at this one. Uh, but I was planning on hopefully getting some of those, but I, they didn't have any, but there was one, um, Clint did from the TSA so I'm going to get that one as well uh, and then there was my talk and then there was I have to contact two other people uh, no one other person because there was one more student that did a talk with um, uh, some turtle related stuff so that's oh. yeah three talks probably so once yeah I get those I'll just send them over and I'll do some editing on that I guess and, okay yeah now I've never been to T. TV- TTPG or any of those conferences, uh, do they allow filming of the talks there as well? I'm not sure. This is my first time too. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if they will or not, but I'm assuming that they'll get them on film. I'm not sure yeah. how it works. They will, they will not get them on film. They might film yours, because <laughs> okay. be, but um, nobody's filming mine, I can tell you that. Um, well, Anthony, you're going to have a tripod set up for yours so we can air it. Okay. Thank you. Um, you're going to get a tripod set up for mine? I mean, I'll hand, I'll give you a tripod to bring with you. I have a tripod. Then you don't well, need my tripod. Tripod. But yeah, we'll, um, but yeah we, do, we not necessarily best on air conversation. Uh, but yeah, check with Russ, see what we can do. All right. Yeah. Because we could use our skills to help pass some of that stuff out for them, which could in, uh, increase um, increase uh, attendance for them in the future with people getting a chance to see what it's like too. So. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe we can do something with that to coordinate there. Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes to go. So, um, you know, Michael, we talked a bit, you talked a bit about just how supportive your parents have been. And I'm sure that's a huge, huge piece of of what's helped you develop this passion as well. Because nothing's real. Your parents have made sure to nurture it as opposed to squash it, right? Um, but so what other things, um, you know, as a student who's really getting into this stuff, you could give us a unique perspective on, on what, you know, things adults and other people can do that excite students about the natural world. And maybe even in particular, what is it about turtles and tortoises that like when you're talking with your buddies, right? I'm sure not all of them, not many of them are huge into turtles and tortoises, but what like, what are the kinds of things that you talk about that end up perking their, their, their interests? Cause those could be like things that for the rest of us, when we're trying to reach, you know, young adults, students, and children that might help us figure out how best to nurture that love of the natural world that you have. Yeah, 
So that's a loaded question. And I think I, I like a lot of psychology stuff too, but, and I think everyone's different. Um, and I think a lot of times people focus on trying to instill a passion in someone, uh, especially at young ages, uh, and it doesn't necessarily work. But I think some of the best ways are, I guess, with this kind of stuff isn't to force upon the person uh, just trying to learn in like specifically with like natural world I think it's just good for people to experience it uh, for myself once I got into the reading of turtle books I wanted to go experience all this stuff uh, and my parents like you said they they nurtured that pat that 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 urge uh, and I got to see everything uh, I got to see that kind of stuff um, and at the same rate, I didn't get to, I don't do everything because I feel like if you do everything, it's just gets boring. Um, and just really, you gotta, you got to leave some stuff. Um, and sometimes when you have a little bit, when you want to do something, but you can't do it, then it actually makes the urge to do it better. And you want to work harder to get to that point. Uh, but I think just experience and just, uh, throwing the wood in the fire, uh, as opposed to trying to set it with a match. Uh, I think that that's really what causes a passion uh, because I think everyone just has this idea and sort of how they think uh, and it's sometimes if someone else is trying to sort of figure out how the other person thinks they might interpret it wrong uh, and especially with the turtles and tortoises uh, what's so fascinating at least about them for me uh, is that really everything about the animal is um, just the, the unique biology pretty much everything about them is unique there's not really anything close to really anything else um, and just how they're so different, uh, physiologically, just so many adaptations, uh, to life and the diversity of species. Uh, I can't tell you how many people, uh, when I say I like turtles, uh, they're like, uh, which one? And I'm like, well, I like all of them. And they're like, so you, you like all seven, right? And they're, they're just referring to sea turtles. And so, uh, and then I started to teach them about how many there actually are. Um, and it's just, it's interesting to see how interested they just become from that one conversation. Uh, but I think the main thing for me is that I had the opportunity to sort of get the wood thrown in the fly fire as opposed to someone trying to start it. So, um, just, honestly, <coughs> that's just the main thing and just everything really is fascinating about them. So how do we throw these other kids in the fire, so to speak, since you said you were throwing <laughs> the fire? <laughs> yeah. Um, is it, sorry, yeah, metaphorically, it's just the, the you fire. You said don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, Expose them to it. Don't force them. I think a lot of times I found that I like mentor mentorship is that something really cool uh, when someone who has experience in something that someone once they learn they kind of love it, uh, and someone who is sort of made their living or sort of embraced to whatever the passion is they're looking for um, can teach that person sort of their ways. Uh, but I think at the same rate, the person, age groups matter too. Uh, and like I went to in, the International Herbological Symposium this year. Uh, I won that. I won the award to go speak there. Um, and there were so many kids there. And every single kid that I met, because they have a reward, award program, um, was extremely knowledgeable about reptiles. Um, and they weren't just knowledgeable. They were passionate about it. And I've met a lot of people, I guess, who say that they love this kind of stuff and within a month they're just not into it anymore. Uh, and it's not really about that. It's just about, I guess, loving it. And these other kids, when I was around them, I probably learned the most in that three day symposium uh, from just being around these other kids who are my age. And I think it goes the same, um, like, you know, when college, when college kids present uh, work they've been doing and they meet other kids that are their age, they can discuss that kind of stuff. Uh, but if they meet sort of, they're working with a professor who's just teaching them as opposed to them learning, I guess. Uh, and the professor is, is all, they're, they're obviously learning from that, uh, from the experiences they're having, but from the other kids, they're just learning different perspectives and just associating in a different way. I can't necessarily explain how it works, but I did learn so much from those kids um, and just also from mentors. Uh, so I think that, that that's kind of how you, I guess, start that passion I guess, and how you could do it. All right, thanks. Definitely a well thought out answer, and you definitely have some perspective on that too. Um, <clears throat> by the way, make sure you say hi to your parents for me too. So, <laughs> <clears throat> I remember meeting them last year as well. Yeah. So. Hey. 
Michael, I have a question. I, I don't know if it's actually asked before I, I got sidetracked. I apologize. Uh, what species are you working with at home currently? Uh, currently at home, I misspoke earlier. I have 10 or nine different turtles, uh, not species. So I have a soft shell, um, four ornate box turtles, um, a peninsula cooter, a red eared slider, um, a three toed box turtle, and a desert tortoise. And that's it. Awesome. Oh, so, yeah. And sometimes I want the cooter. That's going to be a big turtle. It is going to be a big turtle. I can go grab it. It's right over here. Uh, <laughs> he looked like he was in his turtle room. So, oh, yeah. It's I saw the garage door and I'm like, he's not in his bedroom unless he lives in the garage, in which case we need to have a different conversation about how supportive his parents are. <laughs> uh, in the garage. That was funny, Steve. <laughs> that was good. I'm smiling. Here's the here's the peninsula cooter. This one, it's a it's a small one. I've had this one for maybe six months now. I got okay. it summer, so it's just it's a small one. It's grown. I think it's about double the size already. Yeah, it looks like it's getting pretty domed already too. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it's I, I I watch a large one, like one of the the very big ones sometimes, uh, and I'll compare them. But this one had a little bit of a an issue. I don't love keeping them out here just because the humidity in the garage, uh, when it basks, they don't do as great that I, I find with whatever it is. Uh, it could be something in the water, but I did a whole clean, a clean up. It had a little bit of a shell slopping and fungus. So I fixed that up with some, some antibiotic and or antifungal. Uh, so it's doing better now. Uh, but just as a tip, I guess, from what I've learned from this species, at least, um, I haven't found the best, the, I keep them in a big waterland tub. And I'm assuming that it, it basks a lot. And it, when I first got it, uh, it had some uh, bio, epibiont, which is just like um, algae, algal growth. So I'm thinking there could have been something to do uh, with that or the fact that it's a little bit humid out here. And then they are from Florida where it is pretty humid when they bask. But I don't know about the specifics, but I think that it had something to do with the, the slothing. So just that's a little bit of a, a tail there, I guess. Not really any... But I, I did get rid of it. I, I uh, just cleaned out the whole tank. Um, I've tried to reduce some of the humidity in the garage, and I used some sylvodyne cream and nolvazin solution uh, to deal with it, and it works pretty well over an eight-day period. So, And just stick with the routine. Like I had the, the soft shell um, had a little bit of an infection too, uh, just, I'm assuming because of the potential humidity in here. Um, and I got rid of it really fast with the nolvazin. Uh, and I just stuck with it for a five-day period, and it's gone. So the whole infection is just gone. And that's the only problems I've had uh, with these. So they've done really well. And this one's pretty tame, too. Now, uh, you said keeping waterland tubs. Now, I think Pete is from waterland tubs. He's up by you, right? He's not that far. I'm not actually sure. I know that uh, he's, he's always in the, the He's in the LA area, I think. Okay, yeah. The, he's always at the Pomona. This one I got was at the Pomona Reptile Expo. So, yeah. But he's, yeah, he's got, I, I, the Waterland tub is, I mean, it, it definitely one of the best turtle and tortoise enclosures because it's so, it's so flexible uh, in considerations of like what you can do with it. Uh, you can, there's a land area, a water area. It's just, it's a great, I think it's a great habitat for him. <clears throat> yeah, you, I really, you know, it's nice that everything's contained. The one weakness I feel like they do have is, they just aren't all that deep water wise. Even the the, the even the, the giant sized ones, the water's only sixteen inches deep in, in the large water tubs, which just really isn't actually all that deep for a lot of species. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's because Steve likes map turtles. <laughs> I'm just saying. So you Brett, can what for I do, a lot of other species you want a footprint. Yeah, what I do is uh, I raise the land area so it puts on an incline. It gives you yeah. quite a bit deeper for the water area. Oh, that's an interesting one. That's interesting, actually. Yeah. Pretty good. What? I'm confused. Oh, got it. No, I don't got it. What? I'm not sure what he's trying to get. He's confusing me. Raise the land area? How would that? Yeah. So the, puts the, the, the lip of where. Like, put like a favor under the land area, okay? It puts it on an incline. Yeah. And now you can raise the water level up. 
So, so you end up with part of it where it gets a little deeper because you, yeah. you change the shape. So the depth isn't consistent. It ends up with pockets that are deeper and pockets that are yeah. shallower. And but that, it does enable you to adjust the, the, the max depth. Yeah, I guess. if you need more water volume. You would actually be holding water. less water at that point. <clears throat> no, it's that more water. Actually, I know that they were doing, uh, I think it was Tom Crutchfield, they – they were talking in one of the with the breeding of the uh, the Gunalini, the Gunalini snake necks uh, from New yep. Guinea. Um, they were talking. About, I forget what I was. I was reading something, but they they find more success when they. Of course, it's kind of obvious they raise the nesting area. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. if you actually put the nesting on a tilt, maybe that's increasing the nesting uh, ability. Because I I remember a lot of people uh, they put their nesting box below water level in some situations. Yep um so the turtles are now and they won't nest like that yeah so raise it more i learned it's species specific uh but for some of those ones that nest, <laughs> yeah means. instinct instinct tells that some of the turtle species that the water area is going to flood because it or the nesting area would flood when the water raises because <laughs> it's below water level they they don't understand the separation between the two areas that's artificially created so there are lots of species that instinctually want to have a nesting area that they have to climb up to get to yeah. so that even when they dig down, the eggs are safe from being flooded. And that's, that's why, why, yeah, yeah, Bill, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, tip. That's, yeah. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any questions or. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of questions from okay. uh, the crowd. What? I think you had a bunch of buddies pop up. Uh, somebody said hi, Ant. That was uh, Steve. Um, you know what? Somebody did ask, but it was uh, something we can kind of take off. It's not a question directly for you. Um, okay. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of questions today. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> it happens. We've had other days like that. Yeah, it was more general we'll questions. Show. It was more general questions. A lot of people pop on, like, how do I fix this? Is this okay? Things like that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, ask, ask the I, general question, Kev. Huh? Are we not equipped to answer general questions? I answered them already. Oh, you answered them. Right. Answer yeah. them through the chat. Correct. The chat, yeah. A lot of it's really quick. Keeps our, keeps our focus on the show within the topics of the show. Yeah. We're not asking questions so that Kevin writes back to them. They're asking so that they can get asked on the show. Okay. So <laughs> here we go. Th this isn't. We've got topics. If they ask questions within the topics, we'll be glad to get them out here. Kevin's talking about putting bricks under waterland tubs. We're, that's not a topic. That's a bunny trail. Yeah, it is a bunny trail. It's, we're all about bunny trails. Michael, do you have any questions for any of these guys? Uh, no, I'm just. It's just really cool to be on the show and. Uh, I mean, it's just an awesome experience, and I'm right. uh, just really grateful to have have it. I'm, I'm going to recommend you don't go out to eat with Anthony when you're down there in uh, Arizona. <laughs> why Why is that? I have a reputation. <laughs> Let's just prove that. <laughs> I have a reputation. Uh, he, invited my, he invited my family out for lunch, then he apologized the entire time. I'll put it that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was it was deserved. Yeah, it was deservedly so. Michael, I wanna I wanted to, to just uh, in front of everyone here extend uh, welcome you to my friend's house. This is awkward. Uh, Chris Leone, I don't know if you heard of him, Garden State Tortoise, but he, he runs our that's our, our assurance facility. And um, yeah. with you talking about um, wanting to work with Diamondback Terrapins and um, also being a fan of Testudo in yeah. in captivity, and it sounds like you like box turtles too. Um, I think it would be yeah. awesome. We're up here in the Northeast and, and we get together um, at least once a year there. Um, several of us are usually there more often too, but right around the beginning of June, um, I would say for First probably couple weeks of June, somewhere in there, we yeah. normally plan to get together. And um, it sounds like you travel around a lot. And if you're interested yeah. in climbing backs, you're going to have to travel. But I mean, you've never seen diamondbacks like this where they're literally it's just on the road it's it's crazy to see them when, when they first start coming up so um i would say june um if you're interested you know let's let's talk about getting you out there so you could do some yeah. work in the no, wild also see probably the best testudo collection in, in america at the same time that would be awesome yeah i've followed a lot uh the hermana haven site i love that one i've read most of that and 
it's just it's so cool the stuff that they've been doing uh with that that and that's actually really why i'm really interested in them just with the the garden state tortoise work that they've done um and yeah that would just be really cool uh to head out and see that and i think uh did they do the diamondback leads point right that's the, the yes project. Yeah, that would, that's, that's chris's wife casey who okay is also uh, a part of the turtle room and, and is wonderful she she runs that's her baby and then you know chris kind of runs garden state tortoise and her man i haven but it's all out of the same place so um you know if you're at if, if you're out there with the terrapins then you're you're very close to his place and and vice versa, like really close. So, yeah. so awesome to just head out. So, yeah, that'd be that'd be really cool. Yeah, yeah. So just keep it in mind, no pressure. And uh, part of me feels uncomfortable inviting a fourteen-year-old uh, to come out and hang out. But your parents are invited <laughs> as well. <laughs> yes, please bring your parents. That'd be better. Oh okay. um, yeah. I do have some questions that did pop up since this. Okay. Um, one of our uh, Total Room buddies, Charles Lee, says. Does he have any future projects planned? Uh, he's not sure if that was answered. He hopped on late. Um, just future, uh, I guess, um, in the future. I guess what the future holds, kind of uh, just anything. I, I'm really open to really any opportunities. And um, uh, right now I'm doing some Western pond turtle research. Uh, we're going to do a GIS map uh, coordinated um, uh, urbanization study where we're going to look at Based on GIS, we're going to look at the distribution of pond turtles and where what habitats they're preferring in urbanized streams uh, and localities uh, in Orange County area, uh, where we actually do have a population of them that I've done some work with. Um, and based on some projections, the rivers here don't have that many pond turtles. And based on some statistical stuff uh, that was really kind of basic stuff that was a long time ago, uh, the numbers look like they're probably more sliders than pond turtles in the areas we have. Um, but that was just really basic stuff. And uh, we're looking to start really a real study uh, in this coming year uh, where I'm going to be working with uh, Cal Academy of Science Sciences to just learn where the pond turtles are hiding kind of in these urbanized channels. Um, and then just in the future, always NAFTA stuff. Uh, I, I get a lot of people on Instagram that are just asking, like, uh, how can we get involved? I think that's a huge one. And definitely, I think, foremost, check out the Turtle Room. Uh, there's a bunch of opportunities that you can learn from and available uh, on the Turtle Room. Um, and just like uh, and, and TSA2, Turtle Survival Alliance, uh, they've got the NAFTA opportunities. And all the time there's just things popping up, like the animals, uh, animal adoption, I guess, and, and loan from TSA and – uh, and just all sorts of things you can get involved with. Um, and just like the, the Turtle Room YouTube channel, I love it. It's just, it's uh, random updates and just random little snippets of information uh, and some really good stuff. And especially the podcast too. Uh, I'm an avid listener, definitely. And I've, I've learned a lot from this. Uh, and so if you want to get involved, I think that's one of the main things. A lot of people ask, I'm, a, I'm young, how do I get involved with this sort of stuff? Is just kind of do stuff. You've got, you can't just sit there and think that you're going to get involved. Just go out. Uh, meet people. Don't be scared to ask questions, uh, and don't be scared to get to get told that you you can't do it. Because just go find stuff to do. Because there's always room, uh, always stuff you can do. Um, and then here we have a population of sea turtles uh, that live in a river uh, um, or an estuary, actually, uh, the San Gabriel River, uh, and it's and they actually come into the river because the power plants are discharging warm water. Uh, and so in the coming years, we're going to learn a little bit more about why they're there. And we really don't know much about why they're there. Um, and, and they're shutting off the power plants. So we want to learn what the turtles are going to do, if they're going to stay or leave. Uh, so that's some future stuff. And potentially some stuff in Florida. Uh, I was lucky enough this year to make it down to Dr. Pritchard's um, uh, facility uh, in March. And I, that was an amazing experience. Um, and I'm potentially going to be, hopefully, in this coming year, doing some work on some of the springs there with some of the species uh, and just anything the year holds. And like the Madagascar trip, I mean, three weeks in advance, uh, I found out about that. So I can't say everything that's going to happen, but uh, it's just a day-by-day -day basis to see what opportunities are there. Now, you wrote an article for the Badiger magazine for the TTPG, which will come out at the TTPG conference in November that we were talking about. Um, yeah. I know this because I – uh, help proofread that magazine every year. So I read your article and I absolutely loved it. I think it's great. Um, reading it got me so excited about uh, talking to you on the air tonight. Um, my question again in front of our entire audience, 
Um, a, a new question, but again, in front of our entire audience. Would you be willing to write for us um, something for our blog? Definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, um, on Instagram, uh, I've got to include the, the little plug, but I've done um, uh, Instagram as a official turtle Insta. Um, and I started this um, like four years ago uh, and I never really changed the name because it kind of stuck. And um, But I used to do all sorts of writing. I would do um, I sort of changed it in the past year, just to more personal stuff and kind of the research I'm doing and doing updates. Uh, but I, in the past I did, I did sort of species profiles. Uh, I probably, I think we calculated that on that account, uh, characters that were like 1.2 million or something, out of all the articles, uh, we put it into docs and then I calculated all the words and it was like a 800 page document of everything in like two years I've written on there. Uh, so uh, there's just a lot of stuff on there, but yeah, I'd be happy to uh, write really about anything. Um, and yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be I think that's terrific. One of our missions, really our biggest mission from the beginning is just, you know, bringing information to uh, the general public. Um, you know, that's our education um, goal. That really is our biggest goal um, among so many other important ones. But um I guess that, that's my own interpretation anyway. Steve, you can argue with me if you want, but I, I think that, you know, that, that from the beginning is something that has meant so much to us. So, I mean, you being the, the prodigy that you are, and I'm, I'm saying that only half jokingly, like you really are an impressive young man with a lot to offer the world. And um, if we could help, you know, highlight what you're doing, then absolutely we want to do it. And never, never apologize for plugging your own stuff. You put the time and effort into it. Please use this platform to, to let people know about the good stuff that you've done. And That's half the reason we bring people on here too, is so they can share their stuff with with everybody who's watching. So exactly. we're, we're glad to have you do so. Um, this, by the way, the secret is Anthony always asks those really public questions on here, so you're more inclined to say yes. Everyone's gonna know <laughs> you're a liar. Don't follow through. I'm sorry, I'm being too hard. <laughs> <laughs> But you did say here, so now you have to. So it would be, it would be, a, but seriously, it would be an awesome opportunity to do, and I, I'd really enjoy that. So yeah, definitely, I'll, um, I'll. Anthony will have lots of opportunities for writing to happen. So stay in touch with Anthony. Okay. Okay. All right. Absolutely. We've got we we're, we've got stuff we're trying to make happen here as well. So. So the Fatiger one was actually um, that was the IHS I mentioned earlier for IHS. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. So that was the essay I wrote for that back in I think around right, May. like um, like Michaela's that was in last year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, they put that in because they. So actually, I should tell the story about how I, I got involved with the IHS because it's it's pretty cool. Um, so I was at. Earlier in the podcast, I think it was the first question, uh, we were talking about sort of the reptile um, shows. Uh, and I do go to the Pomona one. I love that one. Um, and so I was there, and the person who runs uh, IHS uh, had a booth. Um, and I was walking by, and the person's pretty well known in the, the turtle community, and I didn't know who it was at first. And we had a long talk, um, and I was asking a question about some of the turtles they had, and I used the Latin name because uh, I wasn't sure what species it was, so uh, I was just curious, and I ended up using the Latin name for them. Um, and at the end of our conversation, we had a long conversation about some books. Uh, the, the specific person gave me a card and wrote on the back to enter the competition, um, uh, the IHS competition. Um, and so I didn't know about this. I had no clue, and this was January uh, of this year uh, at the Pomona Fairplex. And so... Uh, three months later, uh, when we found out the winners, I ended up winning the competition and uh, got to go to IHS, and it was just an awesome experience. And um, just the, the turtle gods, I think, were uh, pretty strong with that one. That was a really cool uh, – it was a cool thing, and it's a cool story to tell. I like to tell just how it, it wasn't like I had known about this for a long time. It was kind of just a random thing, uh, and just, again, everything was sort of in the right place at the right time. Um, and it's just evolved into this, and it's really cool. Um, was that person Ross Gurley? Yes, yes. I didn't know if the name was okay to use on here, but yeah, yeah. that's fine. I mean, okay. you know, we'll do it. He could be mad at me if he wants to. <laughs> no, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Really, yeah. 
But I, I'd love to just use that as a segue just to say, like, what he's doing is absolutely amazing. Like, like helping to set up these avenues for young people like yourself, who in the past it would have been so difficult without the internet and social media to be able to figure out, like, what cool is happening. And the fact that you already know about, like, like uh, the Terrapin Nesting Project leads point that you mentioned, like, that's happening literally in the furthest point from you in the country uh, is, is amazing. Um, unless it was like happening in like Northern Maine or something, but like it's super far. And, and like for you to know about that, like it's a testament to like the good work that's being done right now. And Russ is amazing. And I'm so proud having nothing to do with this at all, but so proud that people like yourself and our very own Michaela, who, who was able to, uh, you know, get an article published in the bad Girl last year and speak at TTPG last year. And she spoke at turtle night in Daytona this year. Um, you know, you're the you're the new Michaela story this year, which is so cool. He's he's built this infrastructure so that so that this sort of thing can happen every single year, and we're so lucky to have that. I don't know if people realize that it's even happening, but uh, what a wonderful thing for the community and for you guys. And I just think you know, if you were coming up like when we were younger, you you know maybe this opportunity didn't exist, um, and you'd have to work harder and make. You know, hopefully, luckily, you bump into somebody at a show because those existed. But I don't think you'd be as plugged in as you are, you know, like with Jordan and uh, so many other people that you've been able to, to get to know. I just I think it's wonderful. And um, it's a great time to be involved in this. We talk so much about what a bleak world it is for turtles and how difficult it is for those of us who love these animals and want to see them do well in the wild, um, in their natural environment. And, but at the same time, it's such a wonderful time to share what's actually going on. We don't have the blinders on. We know how bleak the situation is. Oh, yeah. We're, you know, and, and we're so connected like never before to actually do something about it. So I, I just think it's amazing. And, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's yeah. Amazing. Just the situation that the turtles and tortoises are in and just seeing like once you get connected and once you do the work to find out how you can get involved – uh, you just learn about so much stuff and um, just there's so many organizations that are just involved in the, the, the conservation aspect of it and, uh, and just in different ways, uh, too, uh, which is interesting how I guess uh, the turtle survival does a lot of captive stuff, but also uh, supporting field research and field research and the turtle room, kind of the same thing, uh, but a lot of captive things and sort of a network of people. Uh, sort of as TSA is, but there's kind of different focuses, uh, which is very crucial. Uh, and captive breeding uh, and, and uh, wild and research go hand in hand. I mean, uh, especially with these endangered animals, right? If we can, if we can captive breed and we can get them in, in higher numbers, potentially in the future, if we can learn more about them and what we can do to save them, uh, we can put them back. And um, there's just so many cool projects. Uh, I just love following along with so many of the turtle room projects. I remember... Um, I believe that there's Calusius Nanus, the breeding. Um, I, there's, I forget what, who's doing it, but I know that that's very, um, that's a big thing. That's just, it's pretty cool uh, for that species. Not really much, is, not much is known about them just because they're pretty hard to con access. And, um, and some of, yeah, just there's so much cool stuff going on. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's about that time where we should probably wrap up. Um, thank you for joining us again. Uh, it's been another good hour and 15 to hour and 20 minutes on the podcast. Oh, yeah. um, we'll be glad to have you again to talk about some more adventures. Keep in touch uh, with Anthony, uh, with Kevin, with, with all of us. We'd be glad to have you join us in, in June. Like we mentioned as well, um, be great to get you some hands-on Terrapin work and with the turtle room and yep. turtle room project and yeah so it is i can't believe it is we're, we're we're a third of the way through september folks so i do want to remind everybody before we go that in just another month or so we'll be starting to offer calendars again so um that's a, a one of our big uh items every year that supports uh our work as well as we donate some back to the turtle survival alliance as well um, so that's another good collaborative uh, project coming up. So check, so just keep your eye out for calendars in about a month or five weeks. And uh, I think that's that's it. We that's all we have for tonight. Um, 
As always, we'll be back next month. The next show should be um, Monday, October 1st. Uh, Kevin, do we have a guest lined up for Monday, October 1st yet? Um, honestly, I don't know at the moment. I have to look into some uh, some emails. So there you have it, folks. Stay tuned through our social media channels for upcoming guests for Monday, October 1st. So um, again, Michael, thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you. Anthony, have a good night, Kevin. Have thank a good you. night. Michael, keep kicking butt in school, too, because that'll get you where you're headed. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. It's been awesome. Thank you. It's really been an honor. Yeah.